All right, we're uh, we just hit ten o'clock. I want to welcome everybody to this week's edition of the Long Coffee Break. My name is Sean Davenport Smith. I am a sales engineer with Lawn Building Technologies, specializing in hydronic and plumbing equipment sales. Uh, and this week we've got James Steith, who is our regional manager with Spirotherm, and we're going to be talking a little bit about Spirotherm, their product. And with that, I will hand it over to James. James, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, as you notice, my name is James Stith, regional manager for Spirotherm. Uh, I haven't been with Spirotherm all that long. I've uh, been a consulting engineer for over 20 years, uh, PE in Texas, and uh, just recently uh, joined the, uh, the dark side uh, but partly because I've felt strongly about uh, Spirotherm for a long time. Um, and what we're going to talk to me today about uh, is air and why air is a problem in your hydronic systems. Uh, I know from my experience and talking with others that it's not a subject that gets a lot of attention. Uh, it's not something that's taught to young engineers. Uh, so if it's if it's something you're not aware of, then, you know, it's not your fault, but we're going to try and fix that today. Um, so water just naturally has air in it all the time. All naturally occurring water has air in it. Uh, and in your system will get air in it primarily from initial fill, but also from makeup water. And anytime you, you crack the system open, whether planned or unplanned, the water gets out and air gets in. Next. So clues that you've got air in the system, you noise is a problem, bouncing gauges because air is compressible. Uh, and then, you know, any of your equipment not doing what it's supposed to do uh, is a good sign that you've got air in your system. So James, let me stop you real quick. So you're, you're bringing up the point, noisy piping and pump cavitation. Uh, you know, when I'm standing in a mechanical room and I'm hearing those pumps going, I hear water moving through the pumps water moving through the pipes, that's really air that's what I'm hearing, right? Correct. Uh, anytime you're hearing noise in a mechanical system, unless it was designed to make noise, uh, that noise is inefficiency. That's energy going to sound that was supposed to go somewhere else. In the case of a hydronic system, it's almost always air in that water causing that inefficiency. So air is expensive. That's what we're really gonna talk about today. Um, you know, that's the reason air is a problem is it's expensive. It reduces heat transfer, it reduces pump performance, and ultimately it's what causes the corrosion. Uh, you know, people say, well, water's got uh, oxygen in it, but it's not the oxygen in the water that's a problem, it's the oxygen in the air that's a problem. There are three types of air in your water. You've got the entrained air, which is small bubbles circulating with the flow. You've got trapped air, which is, you know, pockets of air that are not moving with the flow, usually at the high points in the system. And then you've got dissolved air. Water naturally dissolves air. And we'll talk about that with the next slide. So Henry's law discusses the solubility of air and water. And you can see from the little red arrows at 60 degrees and 60 PSI, uh, you've got 10% by volume of air. I mean, that's pretty significant. If you then increase that to 180 degrees, you could see that now you're only 5% air. And so that 5% dissolved has now gone to micro bubbles in your, in your system. I think we're all familiar with this equation. Uh, you know, the 500 is made up of 8.33 times one times 60, which is the heat transfer coefficient in the, excuse me, the specific heat and the density, but that's just for water. We know if we add glycol that we have to make adjustments to that uh, equation. And it also assumes an air-free system. But we see that the specific heat of air is only 24% of that of, of water. And, and that's a, a small issue, but density next is really huge. The density of water is huge compared to air. So the next slide, we put those two back into the equation. Instead of 500, we get 0.153. So that tells us that water is over 3,200 times more effective at transferring heat. That's why we use hydronic systems to begin with, because it's more effective. Uh, 
as far as pump energy is concerned, this comes straight out of a Gould's pump manual, and it says only 2% gas with, of the air by volume will cause a 10% reduction in capacity, which seems huge. But just after that, it says 4% uh, will cause a reduction of over 43%. Can you imagine losing 43% on your pump? Uh, now, I'm not saying that all the pump curves are wrong because they don't account for this. They, I'm sure, are tested with normal water. And so, you know, they are accurate. What I am saying is that if we take all that air out, we can increase the effectiveness and capacity and efficiency of the pumps. Corrosion. Corrosion is generally a, a reaction between iron or, or other metals and oxygen. Um, the oxygen in, in the air, in the water, as I said before, uh, the first thing that forms is magnetite. That's not really all that bad, but if you continue to have oxygen in your system, that'll transform to hematite, and that's really aggressive. And you can see the pictures of the pitting. You know, the material that used to be in those empty pits is now dirt flowing through your system. So if we can get rid of the oxygen, we can get rid of the corrosion. And you and I think we all know the 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 problems that corrosion in the system causes. That's that's not new. And, and the reason it's well known is because you can see it. You can see all those issues in those pictures. Next. And uh, the things that we, we find the biggest issues are the pump seals, control valves, you know, the heat exchangers, the, the tubes, and the chillers and boilers. Uh, you know, everything in the system that's metal gets, gets affected. Uh, so the way we, we fix that is uh, we have something called the spiro tube. That's the coalescing element inside of our uh, air separator and dirt separator. <clears throat> and that's what allows us to get 100% of entrained air, 99.6% of the dissolved air. And because we get that much dissolved air, the water actually becomes absorptive and will suck the trapped air back into solution. And that allows us to get 100% of the free and trapped air as well as particulate down to five microns. Now, all of that uh, proven, it, we say that's proven because we have independent test data that shows that, that that's what our uh, separator will do over time. You also notice, next slide as well, that no matter how big it is, in the picture before, that was about a three inch. Uh, in this picture on the left, that's, I believe, a 36 inch pipe size, the largest we've ever made. And even in that big, you can see it's completely full of the element. And on the right there, that was uh, two bundles that come from uh, a, two units, a pair of units with uh, removable. If they're not removable, they're not packaged up in a bundle like that. But when they are removable, they have to be. So next, this pictures that customers have sent us before and after. On the left and on the bottom, those are glycol, which is why they're not clear. Uh, but all four pictures show a dramatic increase going from mud or coffee to clean water. Uh, and in the top picture, it shows it, it only took a week for that to happen. That's pretty impressive. So this is a, a project at Youngstown State University. Uh, they did an energy retrofit uh, in their plant, replaced boilers, pumps, chillers, all that stuff, specifically for <clears throat> energy improvements. And when they were done, they didn't really see the uh, results they were looking for. So about a year after that, they replaced the tangential with our bright yellow uh, high velocity air and dirt separator. And at the very top of that page, this is a, a page of case studies and, and we have lots of case studies. We'll be happy to share with anybody who wants more information. Um, that's a little hard to read, so we'll go to this one. And those first few bullet points there all come from that Youngstown state. So almost immediately after swapping the air separator with one of ours, <clears throat> they saw a chiller tonnage increase of 15.9%. They saw decreased pump speeds of 22%, which saved uh, pump energy of, of 50%. They saw their system delta Ts go up. They saw their uh, leaving air temperatures at the coils go down. And all of that just from removing air from the system. Now, the rest of these bullet points come from other projects, uh, but they're all notable. Uh, the, the bottom on the left, you know, because we've removed all the air out and the oxygen, we reduce corrosion. And so the prevention chemicals go down by 85%. Um, 
we, we took 20,000 gallons out of a system of air that was 8%. Um, you know, reduced startup air purging from days to an hour. Uh, and as already noticed, we eliminate noise. So one of my colleagues tried to bundle all that, that case study information into something that was a little bit more concrete. So he used the energy modeling uh, requirements in ASHRAE 90.1, I believe it's Appendix G, and he modeled a hospital because he's in, in Nashville and there's a lot of big hospital companies there. Uh, so he thought that would be important to them. He modeled chilled water and heating water, uh, you know, typical just using the, the standard for a hospital that's in that uh, guideline. And next shows some of the, uh, the, the four, five uh, climate zones he modeled and some of the inputs. You'll notice that the uh, energy rates on the right vary widely based on location, and that's important. But the output is really what's most important. And there's uh, some extra data there that doesn't mean a lot to me, but the middle one, the simple payback, I think everybody understands. So what we're comparing is the energy usage that would increase due to having air in a system and he modeled this very conservatively. He didn't use 15% like what our best example there in the Youngstown State. I think he used half of that. Um, he didn't use you know, 50% energy savings on the pumps. I think he used 20%. Um, he was very conservative with, with what he put into the system. But even still, the energy savings, or I should say the energy lost, uh, compared to the cost of a high velocity air and dirt separator, you can see the payback period there in the middle. For the chill water, every one of them was less than half a year because those numbers are in years. Uh, for the hot water, most of four out of five were, were less than a year. The only one that's not is Tampa, <clears throat> which I don't think anybody would be surprised that heating water in Tampa did not pay back as quickly. <clears throat> but notably, the chilled water payback in areas such as San Francisco and Boston did pay back because their energy costs are so high there. So to wrap it all up, cost benefit analysis for the owner, uh, you know, to lower total cost of ownership, basically energy savings, maintenance savings for the system operators, you know, less maintenance calls, less equipment failures. Uh, for the engineers, you know, time is money, right? For everybody and engineers, I always seemed like it, I was the first call when anything happened at a site, you know, oh, what's wrong with your design? Um, you know, and all of that was unplanned for. So all those phone calls, all those meetings you have to go for, all of that's unplanned, that's extra dollars. And if we can cut all that out by saving, saving us that uh, time and, and effort, that's money in our pockets. Uh, and then finally, with the contractors, you know, it's going to help help them get off the job faster. It's going to help them uh, reduce their callbacks as well. Um, and basically, removing air from the chilled water or heating water system, or even removing dirt from the condenser water system, uh, helps every part of that hydronic system work better, and it saves money very quickly basically pays for itself in less than a year. That's pretty much the, the wrap. Uh, <clears throat> here's a, a field installed system that maybe Sean can help you with. That is not a factory option, just saying. Uh, that's all I got for today. Thanks for your time. Back to you, Sean. Yeah, James, I, I'll just wrap it up with a few quick questions as well. Um, I think, a lot of us understand that the tangential systems and the coalescing systems are, you know, completely different. You're definitely getting a better value out of coalescing. But what about our competitors in the coalescing market? Are they seeing the same results as Spirotherm? And if not, why? Well, honestly, we don't really know. We haven't seen a lot of uh, output from them. We haven't seen the case studies that we have collected and published. If you go to our, our website, <clears throat> which is pretty, pretty simple, uh, you can see some of those as well. And we're just not seeing that our competitors have published any of that information. I know as an engineer, I would ask for that stuff. I would ask for their independent testing and I would ask for all their case studies. 
that showed the improvements and I, I never got anything. Um, that, I mean, that was one of the reasons that I was so sold on Spirotherm as an engineer and, and on flat spec it is, is because nobody else could provide me anything to compare. As to why, um, I, I, I go back to the picture where our, our vessel is completely filled with the spiro tube element. And that's what makes the magic work. Um, all of our competitors, none of them are completely filled with anything as far as I know. And what they do put in them is just not as effective. You know, it might be a strainer basket, it might be some pawl rings, it might be whatever, but one, their vessel is not full. So there's plenty of ways for the water to get around the media. And, and that just makes it a wide spot in the pipe and no better than a tangential separator, really. So really <clears throat> just, if, if you want to spec spirotherm and you've got that question, Make sure to ask for a third party testing data that shows that they're able to meet the performance. And I think that is huge. Uh, it definitely is a, a great product that makes everything else in your hydronic systems work more efficiently and last a lot longer. So I really appreciate it, James. Uh, I want to, you know, express gratitude to each and every one of you with this week of Thanksgiving coming up. We will not be having a, a coffee break next Thursday. I uh, hope everyone has a safe and wonderful holiday, but please join us the week afterwards where Bobby Henderson, uh, he'll be talking about air in your steam systems with industrial steam and talking why it's important to de-aerate those systems. So I appreciate everyone. Y'all have a great rest of your week and a wonderful holiday. And with that, we'll sign off. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.